Yeah. Right. There it is. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everyone, great to, to see you all. Um, so my name is uh, Vitanella Pietersen. I'm the chair of the Development Studies Association Ireland, and I'm here to welcome Jonathan Men, who um, who's going to give a lecture um, on the future of global cooperation. Um, in 2021, uh, Jonathan Glennie was uh, our keynote speaker at our annual conference, which was held uh, online uh, because it was 2021. And um, at the time, our uh, theme was climates for and of development. So we were looking at sort of the development landscape and the climate of the development landscape at the time, very much in the context of climate as well. Um, we, the time that the um, conference was held then was in November during the, the COP negotiations in Glasgow. And the framing of the conference very much was around um, the Paris Climate Agreement and how was that setting going to change how we were going to do development, frame development, fund development. And, uh, and you made a, you gave a great address at that point. And I just couldn't help but reflect of how different the context is now. We are three years later and, you know, our priorities are all different. Things have all changed. So, I mean, I think with that in mind, I think it's particularly interesting to hear um, what Jonathan has to say. Um, so Jonathan is a writer, a researcher, a campaigner, um, and he focuses primarily on uh, international development, sustainable development, and financing for development. And um, he is a co-founder of a think tank called uh, Global Nation. And um, his focus is very much on the changing nature of the of international cooperation uh, as the dominant paradigms and the global economic relationship is really evolving at the moment. So um, with that, please, uh, well, take it away. thank you. Thanks a lot, Isna. And um, I'd be interested to know what actually, um, you know, you, you say everything's changed in the last few years. It'd be interesting to hear what, in what ways you think they have, because, yeah, that's what I've been talking about. It's, Thank you very much for inviting me. I live in uh, Colombia, and so spend a lot of time in Latin America, less time in Europe, so uh, and very seldom in Ireland. So I didn't even come over to that meeting. Although I was here for a different meeting long ago, um, so it's great to be here. And I really, I, 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 I will try to make sure there's plenty of time at the end. So, um, I'd be really interested to hear how how these ideas go down and what your um, thoughts are about. So um, let me just start off by explaining this uh, new organization we set up. Global Nation is a thing can do tank because my partner is very much in the strategic advisory world. Um, our mission is around global solidarity. Um, we, we call ourselves Global Nation because we think that a lot of the aspects of successful nation states are now required at the global level. So um, common identities, common understanding of the, of the threats, um, uh, effective and fair institutions, demonstrable impacts of successful institutions and those kind of things. So it's quite a radical um, proposition. Some people don't like it. It sounds a bit kind of, you know, Bill Gates is going to run the world, some people. But uh, for us, it's about learning from the growth of nation states over the last 200 years, what's made them work and what might be applicable at the international level because of that. And you'll see that a lot of our thinking is kind of seeing the globe as one unit in the way that we see countries as one unit. And how do we approach it in that way? If all of us are us rather than a them and us approach. And that might be the kind of, you know, one of the themes throughout this. Um, just to start off with the classic kind of our world is in trouble slides. We're not on target for any of the SDGs. We produce a report called the Global Solidarity Report that I'll come on to later. And according to our analysis, we, we, we say we're in the danger zone. In, in, in other words, um, there are, there's low levels of global solidarity. Um, and we need tons more money. Any, any number of economic analyses will come up with a, a different number of trillions required for the investments that we need in our world to, to achieve the obje objectives we've set, it, we've set ourselves. Now, I gave a talk the other day, and I used this car as, as a kind of, an, I don't know, what's it called, an analogy 
for where we're up to as a, as a, as a global corporation e ecosystem, the international development ecosystem. Basically, we're broken down. We haven't got enough fuel. We haven't got enough money. But in the last few weeks, I've been trying to be more positive. It's quite <laughs> negative, really, to put that up. So I, I've started to use this one and to say, actually, you know, we're not, you know, one way you can see where we're at is basically nothing's working. I think, a, I think a more, a better way, and actually, I think more, uh, yeah, I think, I think it, it's not just more optimistic. I think it is actually a better analysis is to say that we are currently building something actually quite exciting. And clearly the world is worrying in so many ways at the moment. But a lot of the reasons that we are at this kind of worrying moment and geopolitics is in flux and all that kind of thing, which, which creates nerves, is actually success. So the rise of the global south, most obviously China, but many, many parts of the world, so much more powerful now than they were 20, 30 years ago. And it's inevitable, I think, that the, 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 the challenges that we face geopolitically and in the world of international development are happening. In other words, they, they're not good problems, they're difficult problems, but they're, result, they're the result of, they're the inevitable result of um, success and uh, growth and reductions in poverty around the world. Nevertheless, um, everything needs to change. Um, aid was conceived a long time ago. This is the famous speech that people kind of link the beginning of the aid world to. 1949, and Harry Truman said, we need a bold new program for making the benefits of our, so our scientific advances and industrial progress available for the improvement and growth of underdeveloped areas. And you can see in that language, the kind of original sin maybe, or the kind of the, the basis of the problems we have with using the current system, basically the same system, but yeah, very impressively actually in a way, Truman and others built over the next 20 years. But it's, it's clearly old fashioned for our times. And I, I, I kind of list three conceptual constraints that I think are holding back the international cooperation uh, ecosystem from building something appropriate for the 21st century rather than the 20th century. Now, the first constraint is the idea that aid is time limited. So therefore when countries cross an arbitrary and stingy poverty line, they will no longer require concession of international public finance. So ever since I came into this business, I came, I came up through the NGO world, you know, Save the Children, Christian Aid, and I think even within government um, agencies, the line is our job is to do ourselves out of the job. And any number of big leaders will say that. You know, in the book that I wrote, I quoted Obama, I quoted the head of the African Development Bank. They all say, good aid is aid that comes to an end. The point is to, to not be in work anymore. That's wrong. I can understand why it's for, and, 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 the, and the need to, quote, leave, quote, aid behind is totally correct. But the idea that therefore we have, there is no future for a, for a strong international public finance system globally is wrong. But it's deeply ingrained in the way that we think in the development sector. The second um, conceptual constraint is the idea that all money is the same. Now we know that all money isn't the same quite obviously in the national, um, in, 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 in national politics, the idea that the health system needs to be funded either by the public sector or by the private sector or by foundations and, and charities, quite clearly they're very, very different models. In the, in the world of international development, international finance, we often do things put like the MDG financing gap or the health financing gap or the SDG financing gap. And the way that that's done, like, I quoted the number just earlier, 2.4 trillion. The way that's done is just kind of somehow say what's required overall and where can we find money for it? As if all kinds of dollars are the same. It could be Bill Gates, it could be um, uh, the national governments taxing more. It could be people's own pockets. It could be anything, any number of things, as if it doesn't matter. Of course it matters, it clearly matters. And I'll come on to that. And then the, the last um, conceptual constraint is that cooperation is one way. And you can hear it in the Harry Truman's statement, but it's there really still in 2024 in most of the work that we do, the idea that there is resources in the global north that needs to be shared with the global south, but it's clearly true in that it's in terms of in terms of uh, wealth and financial resources. But further than that, the idea that there's knowledge and capacity, and that the north generally knows stuff, and that the south generally has to learn stuff, 
everyone sitting here will, will just instinctively think that's sort of obvious nonsense, but it's not nonsense to most people. So the way that most people think about development, and I, and I think even within the development sector, is still that the answers are in the north and uh, the south can learn. And that's why people like me are consultants and the vast majority of development consultants look like me and come from where I come from rather than a genuinely international um, cooperation system. In fact, what, what I thought about calling this talk something like the future of cooperation is cooperation, which basically means at the moment it's not you know, cooperation implies two parts uh, and we don't we've never actually built that or more than two parts. We've never actually built that. Um, so what is the future of global cooperation? Well, the way that I conceptualize cooperation, I actually wrote a paper on this for the UN a few years ago, they're still using, is that there are three types of cooperation, financial brackets and in kind, transfers, which is the thing that most people think about, certainly in the global north, think about aid, moving money from one country to another. Different kind of cooperation is capacity building, so sharing ideas, um, you will know what that means. And then the third is policy change, which means speaking about it um, with Siobhan, corporate responsibility, working together uh, on uh, minimum taxation for corporations and billionaires, corporate responsibility, or, uh, intellectual property, all the various things that are actually probably more important than, any, than the other two in terms of providing the context for all countries to, to develop and progress. The good news is, and I think this is really good news, and, and I want to say that we're in, it's like, rather than think that we're in a depressing moment for international cooperation, someone persuaded me the other day that we're in an exciting moment for international cooperation because we're actually emerging quite obviously, it will take ages because there are interests involved and deep, um, uh, I guess, ideologies and attitudes, but we're emerging from three, at least three, and you'll probably come up with more, really important paradigms that have dominated certainly, you know, all, all of my life. So um, neoliberalism, you know, we, we usually date that to the late 70s, early 80s. Clearly it's not over, but the, but the, but the, but the attacks on it, the theoretical and academic attacks on it, and even now the political ones are quite strong. So I think that's coming to an end. The colonial mindset clearly, is is being challenged against you don't know, move too swiftly away from these things that are deeply ingrained but clearly that is constantly being challenged and then thirdly bipolarity up until i guess the 90s and then uni uni unipolar power is clearly moving towards multipolar power and that's the kind of clear progress and at the same time it raises lots of challenges so these are the three things i'm going to talk about as the kind of evolution of international development and cooperation. So, so the first one relates to financial transfers is something we're working on for global public investment. The second one relates to capacity building is something else we're working on called circular cooperation. Those of you that know about kind of triangular cooperation will see the kind of geospatial analogy that we're doing there. And then the third one, I mean, there's so many things that need doing on that, but the thing that we're working on is, this, is, is, is the idea of investing in solidarity. And that might, might sound obvious, but um, we think it's an important thing to focus on. And I'll, I'll explain why. So, global public investment. I wrote this book called The Future of A, Global Public Investment, and one of my friends said it's a terrible title because it's like, it's like calling a book The Future of Television, The Internet. Because what we're actually proposing is so very, very different to aid. So he thinks it was annoying to put the word aid in the title, but I had to really in order for people to know what it was about. It just puts the global public investment. It sounds like, you know, maybe you're from Goldman Sachs, I don't know, writing about that kind of thing. Anyway, there we are. It was the second book I wrote that had a bad title. The first one was called The Trouble with Aid Why Less Can Be More for Africa. And uh, I wanted to call it basically something like Aid and Africa Making It Better which is quite a positive spin. But the publisher just said, yeah, it's just so boring. No one buy it. So can we have something more challenging? For that one? Uh, okay, you can still get that book as well if you want. Uh, it's a bit old now. So the main, I think, insight that, that I think needs to underpin the future of the financial transfer, the aspects of international cooperation, is that public money is special. Now, again, that might seem really obvious to people in this room, 
But neoliberalism taught us otherwise. It did not centralize the state, it did not center public money. And you know, one of the globetrotting economists today is Marina Matsukati, and she has communicated, I think, brilliantly the, the, the special importance of public money at the national level. And she's she's arguing that the way that we thought about public money for many decades is that it's 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 only really valid to fill in where the market fails. As, as so there's a kind of a negative approach to the public money at the national level. And she's saying no. Public money is crucial in a very positive way. She wrote this book called The Entrepreneurial State, you know, the, the creative and special use of public money. And she called it a, a first resort, not a last resort. And aid is very much presented as a last resort. In other words, when countries, quote, graduate from aid, they do so because there's enough domestic taxation and there's enough access to foreign direct investment, private, private money. And that's considered to be, therefore, they don't need international public money anymore, because all it ever was, was filling a gap. It's kind of the Jeffrey Sachs, I'm not, I don't want to criticise Jeffrey Sachs, but it's the kind of, you know, big push capital injection argument that after a period of time, that won't be needed. So what I think is required is that we need to think about international public money in the same way as we think about national public money. It's a special kind of money that is going to be required in perpetuity because of the challenges that we face as a world. Um, both the big global challenges that affect us all, like climate, digital uh, challenges, health, pandemics, all those things, but also the traditional development challenges of relatively poorer countries, because again, the aid system has been set up to talk about absolute poverty, and then when countries or people converge over what I call this arbitrary and stingy line, then there's no role for aid in Whereas if we think about relative poverty, clearly, just, just as we do at the national level, and to some extent the Europe, region, regional level within Europe, we, we're talking about convergence, and I'll come on to that later. So I won't go into detail here, you've had a look at it, but there's, there's a bunch of reasons why international public finance is special. Now, some of those characteristics are also can be applied to other kinds of finance. It's not that international public finance, I'm not even claiming that it's better than other kinds of finance. No, I'm not anti-private finance at all. It's a crucial part of the mix. Ditto domestic resources, obviously, is the most important of all. But the claim is that it, it is different and it can do different things. And particularly if you think about accountability. If, if you were able to set up an international system which has stained um, not, not ad hoc, but um, kind of statutory international public finance, then that would complement domestic finance, which is related to political um, obviously related to political, to national politics, let's say, clearly different to all kinds of private finance, which are, which are related to profit motive. Whereas international public finance is accountable differently. It's not always better. It can be really complicated, as we know. Donors are, are, are leading too much. But nevertheless, there are different um, accountability mechanisms that are really important. And I always use that phrase that I heard out of Kolesh say in one of the meetings I was in years ago, when he said it, was, it just totally transformed, I think, the, again, the instincts of the development sector, which is that when poverty is dealt with, we leave. And he said, development only really begins when poverty is dealt with, which is again, just transforms our thinking, you know, this is a long-term project and it doesn't go away. So the five uh, paradigm shifts in how we think about international public finance, what has been called aid, uh, are with regard to ambition, from a narrow focus on reducing poverty to meeting broader challenges of inequality and sustainability. And I think that is, I think the sustainability thing is now fairly accepted. So, so in all the big meetings of the agencies and, and, and major, and all governments, the question is how do we pay for sustainability to overtake as well as close development, most obviously climate. Um, the idea that we need to set up a system to respond to global inequality is much less um, accepted and I think would be considered quite provocative in some circumstances, in some, in some context, whereas other people would see it as kind of obvious. The function, that's what I've just been talking about, seeing international public money as a temporary last resort is, is not, is, is from that to valuing it as a permanent force for good, um, both for global public goods and continuing development objectives. Geography, one directional north-south transfers to a universal effort with all contributing based on a fair share formula. Now that sounds quite radical. And, and, and it is, in a sense, that it's transformation of how we think about things. But it's not unpopular. 
And interestingly, we, you know, I spent most of my time in Latin America, and Latin American governments love this, and actually African governments love it as well. If you listen to some of William Ruto's pretty blistering speeches in the last year or so, people say we want to be a part of this system. We don't want to be recipients anymore. Partly for, for the last reason there, for narrative reasons. You know, it is it undignified to be a recipient all the time. That's why countries want to graduate, because it's it's tedious and undignified to be considered a beneficiary, but they need money. So how do you set up a system which isn't about aid and charity, but which does transfer money and redistribute across the world? Um, and then if you do believe that we need tons more international public money, then, it, then the governance side is quite obvious. We can't set up a system or evolve a system in the 21st century that still is managed by an organization based in Paris. We need to UNize it. And one of the yeah, that's obviously a very popular opinion when you go to New York. They're like, what is happening? You know, why is why does Paris still decide? And the, uh, this small group of donors decide what counts as 0.7% revenue across count and all that stuff. And that shouldn't be decided, right? Okay. I put the SDGs there because that was a huge paradigm shift. I think we take it for granted now. It was a massive paradigm shift, but it hasn't been implemented yet in the way we think about finance. And that's the kind of thinking that now has to be applied to finance. Um, so this is a this is a quick summary of what of what we're saying global public investment is a new system to unlock more and better funding to achieve our common goals based on the principles of all benefit will contribute or decide. Uh, GPI would mean all countries committing funds according to a fair contribution formula. So all countries would pay in, yeah, according to their ability. So very poor countries would put in a small amount of money, but it would transform the relationship to one in which we're all co-contributors, even if some are net recipients. Um, and not and away from the kind of donor recipient mindset. GPI would involve a more representative decision making structure, including civil society, enhancing legitimacy and effectiveness. And crucially, it's a long term, it's long term reliable investment. So it's crazy the begging bowl approach at the moment, whereby when you have a crisis, you know, everyone on an ad hoc basis may or may not put money into the pot, and where quotes donors are able simply to halve their aid whenever um, it suits, we need to set up something that's more serious for the 21st century. So th this is an analogy. If you think about, um, so it's an analogy between the national, those by the way at the top there are China and Colombia, you had not guessed already. Um, if at the national level, it's not a perfect analogy. So there are, you know, they're clear, that especially with regard to governance, uh, there's going to be kind of big differences. But this is a, it, I use this analogy to try and kind of share the idea. At the national level, we talk about public spending and investment, not charity. It's structured and sustained, not ad hoc. It's still relatively new. I think that's really important. You know, we, we always live within our time and we think that whatever's possible is what's possible. You know, we've seen the last couple of decades. A hundred years ago, there was very little public spending at the national level. It's a new thing for humanity to tax and spend on things we care about, even at the national level. The European Union started in the 70s to spend money across the region, redistribute massively. Ireland was a huge recipient, of course, probably is still a net recipient, I don't know. Spain only became a net contributor to the EU about five years ago or something. I mean, so, so, so the, so, it's a really important point that I'll come to as well. There's no end date. I'm down here now. There's no end date. So at the national level, we don't say, well, one day we won't require taxes anymore. We won't need to invest in our national public goods. We won't need to invest in redistribution because one day it will be all fine. Clearly, that's, that's not the way we think about the national level. We shouldn't also think about it at the uh, international level. And while it is somewhat redistributive, it's not only about the poorest. So I'm not suggesting that the, the issues of poverty should be diminished, but I'm suggesting we expand our scope of understanding. And most people agree with this now. We should expand our scope of understanding that we're investing in things we care about at the international level that aren't just about poverty. And maybe they're about the environment. Maybe they're about supporting development of business. Maybe they're about culture, um, those kinds of things. And then in some of the regions, we also, um, uh, uh, used very different language. So the aim of very large scale investments within the EU is convergence. Absolutely explicit from the reports written in the 70s that led to the EU funds, the structural funds. 
the point is convergent. Billions are transferred in annually every year to relatively high income countries, to, to literally quite high income countries, so Poland, Eastern Europe, until recently Ireland and Southern Europe, and their grants. So all the discussions we have, and you'll hear the kind of great economists say, well, you know, you shouldn't give grants to X, Y, and Z countries because they should get loans. Well, that's not what we do in the EU. We give very, very wealthy countries huge amounts of money that they do not have to pay back because we care about those countries becoming uh, 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 converging. I'm saying, well, by we, I'm, I, mean, I guess I'm not a member anymore, but Western Europe, the richer countries of Europe have have made large scale grants and they Ireland has been a recipient. So to then say, well, it's not appropriate for Vietnam, it's not appropriate for Ghana, they don't need grants, they can do deal with loans, massively indebting themselves further, often for things that are global public goods, is 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 a, is a function of the fact there's not much money, fine, but it shouldn't be seen as a, as as the appropriate theory of what we're trying to build. And just in parentheses. The comment this often gets is, well, they're just not money. Okay, we can discuss that. But the way that, uh, what, what I would say, when political parties set up their manifesto or come into power, sometimes they're just not money, but they set out the plan. So when there is money, we, sh we will do this. And in fact, you know, the Labour Party in the UK is literally saying that at the moment. We, there's not much money at the moment, but our plan is this. So even if there's no money at the international level and there's no grant money, fine. But with, with the next financing for development conference coming up next year, the point is to set out a direction that is not constrained by whatever the current international economy is in 2025, but actually is thinking about what we need and then trying to get there. So obviously what my, my, my argument is that what you see at the national level, what you see at the international level, we can somewhat begin to build at the uh, contributory, not voluntary, uh, every country has a seat at the table, et cetera, et cetera. So just finally on GPI, how am I doing? Ah, I guess I'm going to whiz through, whiz through the other ones. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's being co-created. It's really important. We spent a lot of time building a global public investment network and bringing in uh, lots of thinkers from around the world. So it's not just kind of one think tank that's coming up with this. This, this. this was our membership of the network a few months ago. It's growing all the time. Um, and it's got, it's growing in support with some of the big names here over there, Piketty, Willie Gandima, Matthew Katu, Jati Goj, and then some countries that have come out and supported it, including Norway, uh, Colombia, where I live, and um, Chile at various levels. Those are kind of aid agency levels. Um, it would be great to see if Ireland wants to come in and support this approach. Uh, right, now I haven't got much time, so I would love to kind of have questions, but you remember there was two other things I was saying that was the future of global cooperation, but that's kind of dealt very quickly with the finance. Um, and again, I'm just trying to, you know, I haven't got a long time, kind of hopefully provoking ideas and I hope that you'll have a lot of comments. So circular cooperation. So th this thought experiment, I used to write for The Guardian and it, I think it was probably the first or second piece I wrote, so it must have been 2010. I wrote up this thought experiment. A group of foreigners turn up in a community they're different colored skin, dress differently, speak a different language. They step off the bus and are ushered into a communal building, a school where some local residents explain the problems they're facing. The foreigners listen attentively, taking notes, sometimes smiling, sometimes shocked by you. I was obviously writing a kind of writing a creative writing. <laughs> Afterwards, the leader of the visiting group stands up, expresses solidarity, and promises to work with the community to help it progress. Now that's the kind of scenario that you would expect in our international development world taking place in Latin America. What I usually do now is like is ask people, you know, where how they've imagined that circumstance. And you know, typically that would be Westerners turning up in an African or a Latin American or an Asian country and kind of sharing knowledge and listening. And then the challenge I make is well just turn it around. What if that's a group of Ghanaians or a group of Colombians turning up in Ireland or Limerick uh, or Manchester? And, and looking at the problems that there are in those in those places with drugs, with knives. Oh my God, Latin American mums cannot deal with the fact that there's knives in London schools. It's crazy. I mean, actually, the problems that there are in across uh, the Western world are quite obvious. So why don't we have a system where people from all over the world share their experience and knowledge? And of course, that's not how we've set things up. So. 
again, I'm, I'm assuming that some of you kind of know about triangular cooperation, this language of triangular cooperation. It's quite big in Latin America, it's quite big everywhere, actually, it's getting bigger. So typically, vertical cooperation is typical, but uh, north-south, and you've got horizontal cooperation, which, which is kind of associated with south-south cooperation, although actually a lot of south-south cooperation is incredibly vertical. China, Zambia, for instance, there's nothing horizontal about that. But nevertheless, south-south cooperation is meant to be kind of between similar uh, countries. And then they, you know, developed this idea called triangular, which was trying to break through that a bit, which was fundamentally still set up as a north-south thing. In other words, resources are in the north. You include a south country, so maybe it's Germany, Chile, and Bolivia. Germany and Chile help Bolivia. In fact, I'm, I'm rushing through this. So actually, it's still within that kind of quite 20th century framework. So what we're suggesting is, is, is a new land, is the final evolution for the 21st century is actual global cooperation whereby it's just as likely that Bolivians would turn up in Ireland and share their knowledge of women's rights, children's rights, disability, mental health, um, sustainable cities, whatever it is, as it is the Irish would, would turn up in Bolivia. Clearly, financial resources are not distributed evenly across the world. So that's not something that, you know, clearly there is more responsibility financially on some countries than others, both because they're richer, but also because of history. Um, but the idea that most issues, uh, I'm going to fit through that. It's not going to, that, that, that this way of thinking is not going to solve every um, development problem. But most issues, we should assume that there's just as much experience and knowledge in the global south as there is in the global north. Um, and by the way, the kind of business of international development whereby, again, people like me get well paid to go around the world and share ideas, is not well developed in the global south. You know, we need to envision a world in the next 10 to 15 years where the Colombian development sector is as strong as the British development sector. It's making much more sense. Uh, I'm thinking through this, but I'm hoping you're getting the, the idea. And then finally, um, invest in solidarity. Now, this is, this is a slide we use in our, our work, and it's kind of an optimistic one. It just says, look, you know, we can get downhearted, but actually we've seen great progress over the last 200 years in many ways. It does feel like that's a lot of that is under threat at the moment, um, partly because of, I guess, climate and other things, but partly because of, mostly because of geopolitics and the way that everything's kind of up in the air. And our argument is that you have to intentionally and actively invest in global solidarity because you don't get to where we need to get to in terms of facing our grand challenges and taking care of the opportunities that exist with a kind of adverse, uh, adversarial approach to uh, geopolitics. So, you know, well, we can hate each other and we can compete with each other, but, you know, somehow we'll muddle through. Um, our argument is that insofar as you have more global solidarity, you're much more likely to, um, to achieve our aims. And you can build global solidarity, it's really hard, but we use this model which says you have to, you have to invest in identities, so building public support for collective action, institutions that work and are representative, and crucially, demonstrate impacts. So, and demonstrate is an important word there. If you can't prove to people, and this, this is taken from an analogy from the national level, if you can't prove to people that their institutions and the efforts they're making and the taxes they're spending ultimately and the votes they're using uh, is leading to actual impacts, um, then you're in trouble. And what we said, and I won't go through this, we produced a report um, on the status of global solidarity and our argument was that actually on identities, people's identities show surprisingly strong solidarity. A lot of people are up for spending more tax on global issues, and a really high number believe that environmental obligations should be enforced by international bodies, a surprisingly high number uh, across the world. However, institutions are not strong enough, and crucially in the last year, particularly because of conflict deaths, but also because of um, COVID, the impacts of uh, global cooperation are not being felt. And that matters a lot because that engenders mistrust. Um, again, 
a lot of people are interested, interested in this, and we're not just arguing that global solidarity is important, we're arguing that there is a way to build it slowly, very hard, uh, but possible. Um, uh, that's my last slide, which is just a whole bunch of um, <laughs> statements, I guess. So that's it. Thanks for listening. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Can I just say that we have um, 10 minutes for questions, but we also have the, the useful kitchen here, which is just down the stairs, and, and we can lead you to the kitchen after this. And we have tea, coffee, and biscuits. Um, so for anyone who um, who's not rushing off, you can save your you can have your question now, you can save it to the kitchen, and we can have a bit of a cup of tea and a biscuit after. Okay, so please go ahead with uh, your questions. Just uh, don't worry, I'm sure you can moderate your own questions okay. and yeah. <laughs> go with uh, the hands yeah, up. So. Well, um, thank you very much for what was a very inspiring presentation and a very positive one. And I hope the question questions I ask will ask as quickly as I can. Don't seem to be too negative about that I'm challenging what you're saying because I totally agree with everything that you say, and I think we can really see this moment as a, as a huge moment of opportunity for global cooperation. But the first thing I want to ask you is if this what were to happen, obviously international financial institutions, and particularly you mentioned the UN, the UN revenue world system would be extremely important. But those institutions, so the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and the IMF, are somewhat discredited because they played such an active role in the whole implementation of neoliberal economic policy. So structural adjustment is a kind of conditionality of receiving aid uh, from any developing country. So do you think, my first question is, that we need to reform those UN revenue world institutions or do we need to replace them completely? The second question then is you talk about this, you know, uh, you know, into global public investment and that every country would make a contribution and would go to all countries depending on their level of need or whatever. But when you look at the intense competition that is at a national level for resources, you know, it will be a real ask to get politicians to defend already they're coming under pressure about aid defend, you know, giving aid to other countries, limit the number of countries they're giving it to prove that it's having an impact. So there's a real pressure on politicians to justify and, and you know, legitimate the, the aid that's being given. If we're asking for money to be national resources of what could be used at the national level, be put into this big global pool where it's harder possibly to trace where the money is going and so on, will that be very challenging? And have you thought about the idea of money being raised at the global level, so that perhaps countries, you know, agree at sort of a consensus at the international level between you know, all UN member states that money, new money, will be created. Now that sounds like a fantasy until you think about the COVID and the way money was, you know, produced when it was needed for various reasons, and they called various things and special drawing rights and this, that, and the other. But is it not possible that if the entire global community Every UN member state was in agreement that this global public investment idea was a good idea. That you know countries couldn't agree that and agree an amount of uh, finance that international uh, global public investment that could be generated every year with a view to managing inflation and so on, mm -hmm. and that that could avoid or at least maybe support the and, and be merged with any national resources that could be raised because I can't help feeling just based on the experience of looking at how difficult it is even to get resources for mm. things that are valued at the national level that countries are going to find it easy to contribute money to what's seen as a much bigger, more diffuse way than pot where it might be harder to, mm. to trace uh, impacts. Right, thank you. I'll, I'll take a couple of questions here. Um, great, thanks so much um, for a uh, really, really fascinating presentation. I really appreciate that we only get to scratch the surface uh, um, in, here in front of today. Um, I, in anticipation of our of this session today, I had a quick peek at the, um, the 2024 financing gap in the STD finance for uh, um, development report. Mm. Uh, and I was also reading an EU paper, a position paper around EU development operational funding. And, uh, you know, very interesting. I think the point that you raise around money and indeed the kind of the idea of the new money as well. I think 
you know, it's very interesting. The global stock market capitalization from 2023 is uh, 100 trillion USD, while the shortfall for the S&P is now estimated to be 4 trillion uh, as a consequence of COVID inflation and everything else. And so I think it's really interesting because clearly there is money. Uh, the question is, is there will to do the type of redistribution that you're um, that you're focusing on here? And I don't think that's being kind of addressed really nicely by our text here. My question is a little bit more um, straightforward. Um, and I really want to acknowledge and thank you for the contribution which is focusing on the building of new institutions because I've been very, very sympathetic to that need to build new institutions, global institutions, and also focus on international solidarity. Um, but my question is really around the drivers of poverty, so the reasons that uh, LDC is currently representing about 1% of GDP of that $100 trillion. Right? Um, and to what extent does this, does the proposal that you're developing here address those drivers of poverty? And really that those empirical arguments around the intentionality of uneven development as part of the global economic order mm -hmm. was in the economic base. Thanks. Yep. Okay. We can start to those. So. So it's interesting because the uh, there's there's currently a huge campaign to replenish the IDA, the International Development Association. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah IDA at World at the World Bank. And um, and as 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 always happened in campaigns, you're not allowed to mention politics. And even like people who didn't know a lot better are just just praising the World Bank to the hilt. It's like it's like they've never done anything wrong. And because to be fair, we need money. And to be fair as well, African governments are the leading voices saying we need money. And to to then doing that campaign saying, by the way, the World Bank's been awful for most of its history is not helpful. So I understand that. Nevertheless, the situation in 2024 is quite similar to the situation in the 70s, when everyone's in debt. Um, the World Bank lived a period, and the IMF lived a period in the, in the noughties, where it just wasn't as powerful as it had always been, partly because of the arrival of China in a big way. Um, and and that, that's going to come on to one of your other questions. Maybe it's the same question. Um, um, so, the, the, the answer is both. Your, your question was: Should we be? Should we be? Should we be um, replacing those institutions, or should we be reforming them? And I think the answer is both. I don't think you know the, the institutions that have lived for you know eighty odd years are going to be really hard to reform. Right? That's not going to happen. Really, actually, the growth of other development banks around the world and the arrival of other big money has transformed the reality for borrower and recipient countries and i think that's probably going to continue and but yes we should still we should still continue to try to reform those bit by bit but i mean even just trying to shift small small shifts in shareholder um in, in um percentages is really really hard um but i've got but my, my view would be to really focus on voice and accountability with it yes within those organizations even as you know they get hopefully get replenished or something for the public investment you're talking about, you're talking about a new institutional architecture. Yeah, so it's on that question. So the, 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 the analogy with the national level and the EU level breaks down because we're not suggesting one pot. So in the EU, money goes to Brussels and then everyone sits in Brussels and decides how to spend it. And that's basically what happens in the national level as well. We're not suggesting that at the local level. Not one GPI pot. In fact, I think more likely it's a bit like the way that we manage ODA, but managed representatively and very differently. But it's something like this counts as, as GPI, this doesn't count as GPI. So there'll still be bilateral spending, there'll still be multilateral spending, and a body within the UN would play the role that the, that the OECD currently plays in saying this counts as GPI, et cetera, et cetera, rather than setting up one kind of massive pot. It's more, I mean, I, uh, that's my view. I think some people might disagree. We're still co-creating this idea, but my view is that that wouldn't fly politically, wouldn't actually be optimal um, to try to have one pot um, in that way. So that would be a, a load of different multilateral funds. And I'll answer your question where the money could come from. Again, you know, 
a lot of it does need to does need to come from wealthy nations and their, and their exchequers, and we just have to make that case. You know, like I said, you know, we've been building the argument about public sector at the national level for a hundred years. The the, the the amazing progress we've had on tax in the last year or so. You know, I was in Christian Aid when we kind of started the tax justice campaigns, and that was two thousand and five. I mean, that's taken twenty years to make this kind of progress. So I don't. I mean, that that that's annoying. But actually hopeful. I mean, you know, we we want to make change, and we're under pressure because we all receive three year grants to make change within you know a really short amount of time. Actually, this is history happening, and we need to build and accept that these things are going to happen slowly. Um, the neoliberals built from the nineteen forties and had their moment, had their chance in the late nineteen seventies, and boom, they had forty years of of their ideology. And I think that we have to think a bit in those terms, however frustrating it is. Um, I'm not sure if that answers. Oh, yeah, and there are, yeah, and absolutely it should be complemented by money raised at the, at the international level. And that already does happen to some extent. You, unit aid, you know, um, tariffs on um, flights and those kind of things are being talked about. And I think that will happen eventually. But I think the majority will probably still come from domestic uh, resources. And then, yes, how to adjust real tensions. I, 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 it's a weird situation for me because I do think the global public investment. Um, stuff is really important. I think the circular cooperation stuff is really important as well. But it's nowhere near. People think that because I'm, you know, if you're working on something, it doesn't mean that it's the most important thing in the world. All of us are working on interesting things. And but sometimes people think that because I'm pushing this, it means that I think it's the most important thing to resolve issues of poverty, for instance, in LDZ. But I, I don't. And ultimately, it's quite low down the list in a way. It's it's quite welfare -y. it's quite kind of, you know, making up for um, uh, the problems and actually the most important thing are things like trade relationships, corporate uh, accountability that we've been talking about. The, the amazing work that tax justice people are, are, are doing, which is going you know, to allow countries to raise more money from the businesses in their, in their, um, uh, in their countries. So, so yeah, I, I live in this kind of weird world where I'm working quite hard on what the future of aid looks like and the, and, and the kind of transfers of money across the world. When and, and, and I think they are important. When you actually, you know, if you if you look at the it's somewhat something of a contradiction, but if you look at the climate talks, I'm always struck how climate finance, even with the you know more transformational NGOs, seems to be the number one or one of the number one issues. When actually, it's clearly not the number one issue. But it's an urgent issue for many of the poorest countries. Um, so, so I don't know if that answers that question, but it's, there's a million things that need done to address the real reasons why countries are poor, which is what you're guessing at, and why people within countries are poor. And yeah, so, you know, development, what was it called? Um, dependency theory. I can't, I'm quite an adherent of, to be honest. I know, it's, I know that's really old fashioned. And certainly within countries, the deliberate policy of, of maintaining inequality is, I think, quite obviously the case. Whether it's true at the international level, I mean, probably. And you know, you just see you just see the fear that, we're, that that traditionally powerful countries have, certainly for the last 100, 200 years, of losing their power. It's not just about power, they have enforced their economic wealth using that power, often violently. So um I agree with all of that. Uh, I do think this is important though, and but partly because it is as we enter a quite scary world in which, you know, multipolarity is success, but it also means more, uh, a less stable world, certainly for a period of time. I think this language of cooperation and building things that we can all believe in and building solidarity, I heard someone describe it as a kind of guardrail as we enter this world where you know, we could end up at war. There are already skirmishes, and we could end up with quite a big war as China threatens um, the West's dominance and the US dominance. They're not going to give that up easily, unfortunately, because they're not managing it in a wise way. So the guardrail is the world of international cooperation, which is the world that we inhabit, which makes me feel quite, um, you know, quite, I think, I think it's quite important the work that we're doing, even if it is, less important than the big geopolitical stuff. Yes. It's it's more like a comment, you know, first and foremost, I wanted to thank DSA for having this space, you know, we cannot underestimate the, the, this 
sound in French, you say the cloche, no, the son des cloches, like this, this sound uh, is very much so needed today. And as you said, we are really at a turning point. And so this idea of, um, I wanted to come back to this idea of uh, building solidarity. So I like to go back always to the root of the word, no? What's the Latin word of solidarity? So solidarity comes from the French word solidarité, mm -hmm. and um, it's come from solidere, from Latin uh, word solidum, whole sound, neuter of solidus, solid, not something that is solid. Yeah. Solidarité comes from something that is solid. Yeah. So then I was it's trying going to... going into our report this year. <laughs> you, you try to think, so how can we nurture and uh, uh, instill in the hearts and minds of the leaders, of the individuals, of the children, of the young people, this idea of solidarity? Because you cannot yeah. impose solidarity takes time. So then the same image that you use the car, then you use, for example, water. How do you bring water become ice? It takes time, no? You put the ice cubes in the, the, in the little plastic, you put it in the, in the freezer, and then it takes time. So this idea also to see that this, this think tank that you have is something also that is wonderful to have these spaces, but also that it will take time, that we have understood. The visionaries of the United Nations, Bonnie Cassin or Leon Roussel, took time no? to, to be able to build that to, to fruition. Yeah. The president of Ireland said that the young people today are the arrows and not the targets. And I think that the same along the lines that was mentioned, this new type of institutions, I highly doubt that today and I can't believe that I'm having a, a discourse of a realist because I'm actually yeah. a humanist, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm actually an idealist as well. Not a naive one, but a very ground to earth to say, we have to invest into the people that you have said, you know, all contribute, all benefit, all decide, all uh, participate. And this is also the reason why my interest is into young people of this university, the children who grew up with the international, the Declaration of Human Rights on the right hand and the national constitution of the left. So my, my comment would be more into the who who would be the actors who would be able to to put that into into practice, no? Because it's really at the international in the macro level, you know. But the micro, what would it be? So it's to come back to the ground level and to be able to see that this investment that you're talking about is actually our young people and our the students in economy, you know, who have only one sound of the bell of the realist mm -hmm. in the drama that are always like fighting, but to say that actually there's a little bit of everything. And I think your presentation really showed you were able to put together different uh, courant d'idées, no? different uh, strands. And it's one to say, okay, well, this is some of the things that we have, but how do we move it to the next step? And I think that our young people would be the ones who can take it to the next level for you, you know, and for us actually. Because we are already, I think we all here, you are preaching to the choir, no? Uh, yeah. I think, I don't think anyone here is against the, you know, but it's like, well, how do we actually then bring it to the a wide range of people who may have different yeah. ideas, you know, um, and we can take it to the next level. So it's a lot of different things at the same time, but um, I, 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 I praise you and congratulate you because it's, it's nice to hear this, you know, in the world that we live in today, you know, and this should be more. So the thing I know, the, the etymology that I know, that the my favorite one is, rad, is radical, which comes from the same, which means root in Latin, and it's the same root as the word radish in English, which also means root. But it's, it's, it's useful to memorize that, remember that, because radical doesn't mean extreme. It means getting to the root of problems. And the other, and the other thing on, on the word solidarity, I guess you guys have solid air. Solid air, absolutely. Well, that means, yes. that's an adjective. Yes. We don't have a word in English for that, or rather we do. It's solidaristic, <laughs> and you'll never ever hear it. And in Colombia or Latin America or Spanish, we have solidario, and it's yeah. a word that's used all the time. I mean, it's a really important word. It's very important. And in English, we don't have an adjective no. for solidarity, which I just find fascinating anyway. Parenthesis. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I mean, what we're developing is how do you build solidarity? Yeah. And it is a long-term goal. It involves right, getting right into education because we are made by the time we leave secondary school. You know what I mean? Pretty much. I mean, you can have you can have Damascene conversions, but pretty much your way of thinking is is built. Um, and it, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the case that young people are necessarily going to kind of be on the humanist side of things. You know, they're just as likely to go a different way. 
So yeah, it's about education. It's about we've made up this word by mistake a couple of months ago, which was comms batting uh, division, which is basically so using using communicators. If everyone does it, to, to, it's just nice to have new words uh, to, to to combat uh, division at the national level. We need solidarity, of, obviously, in our own nations, let alone at the regional and global levels. So there's there's, there's I, th I think it's a combination of um, education, communication, and still just the active advocacy for institutions. We need institutions at the international level that work, and we need to communicate that they work. Yeah. And um, and it, yeah, it will take time, but I mean, and you never get there. You know, the history of humanity is a constant battle between trying to do the right thing, losing, winning, losing, winning. So it's this constant kind of trying to persuade people that this is possible. What I think the interesting thing about this is, you know, a lot of the stuff is we've already got some um, experience, but building in new kinds of institutions for the 21st century at the global level has never been done before. You know, we've got 20, 20th century institutions which basically emerged from empire. I mean, most of them were still very, well, certainly the World Bank, the UN, the IMF were, 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 were built during periods of vast colonies uh, across the world. And uh, I guess um, the World Trade Organization might be different to that. Um, Can I just say that the tagline, the future of cooperation is cooperation. This is the greatest thing I've ever heard. It is. It's, fair, it's, a, great, yeah. it's I, a great tagline, you know, because it's a mean and it's a, an end as well. You see? Yeah. It's a mean. We've never done cooperation. To... All we've done is transaction, actually. Yeah. Um, so actually building genuine That's international right. cooperation is actually pretty radical. Okay. Pretty solid there. <laughs> Great. Oh, is there anyone? Is there any other tweet? Call it, Does call anyone want to come and have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee? We can have a few more questions and we can go over the list. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 